Okay, everyone. So welcome to another episode of the Trailblazers podcast, where we try to tease out the habits, key developments of people that have taken non-traditional routes out of their engineering degree. Um, I'm Tyler. This is my co-host, Dave. Dave, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good, man. It's Friday. I can't complain. How about yourself, Tyler? Yeah, right on Friday here too. Nice weather. Can't complain. Things are looking pretty good. Um, we're really excited for the episode that we got today. We had a really interesting uh, guest and we think you guys will enjoyed a lot. So Dave, why don't you give a quick intro to our guest? Yeah, absolutely. Today on the podcast, we had Kaylin Zhao Nguyen, um, who is currently working as a program manager at Microsoft, previously was with IBM as an IT consultant, and before that, spent time at the University of Alberta as a civil engineering student. Um, Caitlin had an awesome perspective, of, like just a great attitude about how she kind of like looks at like the challenges she faces as a student and kind of how to like she overcame these and just like a really good positive outlook on say like um, kind of failures and using those to actually like grow and kind of build um, herself. And then um, some things that I thought were really cool about uh, the episode two is she talks about um, something that I think is really important for young professionals is basically like, how do we set like healthy boundaries for ourselves in regards to work and say like priorities and tasks. So she mentions how basically rather than maybe say like after 6 p.m like taking meetings she's uh talking about basically like you know focusing her priorities on herself and like her life um and i think that's like something that a lot of us as young professionals can take from her book is basically you know how can we set healthy priorities and boundaries like with our teams and our managers um so yeah it was such an awesome episode tyler like what what are your thoughts on it yeah i totally agree you know i had originally read her article on linkedin that will will link which kind of highlight is a more concise version of this conversation uh but yeah, she was was great. Uh, another good point that she touched on is if you come from a non tech background uh, in your engineering degree, how can you uh, learn the skills to get into the tech industry? I know there are a lot of people that are interested in that. It's a very blossoming uh, domain right now. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, it was a really good episode. Um, she touched on a lot of points as well. She she makes a lot of connections uh, between the experiences she's had so far up till now. Um, and then she also has a really excellent way of framing every situation so she can get the most out of it. So, you know, I thought it was fantastic. I know you guys will get a lot out of it. Um, so, you know, over to the episode with, uh, with Caitlin. And before you do that, make sure you do a like and subscribe. That'll help us, uh, you know, smash that like, as Dave always says, uh, it'll help us with the, you know, getting more of an audience and getting more guests and making more people see it so that we can give you guys better content in return. Uh, and then you'll get notifications when we have a new video co coming out, which right now is every second Wednesday. So make sure you subscribe to get that notification. And yeah, with that, uh, over to Caitlin. Uh, just to go off of that, you're at Microsoft now. Maybe you can walk us through a 30,000 foot view of your uh, education to your career so far, kind of where yeah. you started and how you ended up where you are just at the yeah. high level. Yeah, high level, for sure. So um, so for those that don't know me, my name is Caitlin. Um, and then I, I work as a program manager at Microsoft. So situated in Vancouver, so Canadian subsidy. Um, I've had two startups under my belt. Uh, one was e-commerce. The second is a language learning app that I started with one of my good friends. So essentially right now, I am really focused on the product space, learning everything I can about tech products, how to scale it, uh, what people want, uh, what people need, um, what are the user experiences that come with any great product. Um, however, <laughs> traditionally, um, I was, I did um, study in civil environmental engineering. So um, my education is around uh, water treatment, um, you know, paving roads and construction. I'm very familiar with the hard hat situations, talking to oper uh, to construction uh, foremen and, and all that stuff. So I did five years in that, and now I'm in an entirely different world uh, where I'm learning about, you know, SDKs <laughs> and, you know, IPs like video uh, conferencing. So like cameras and microphones and noise cancellation. Um, so entirely different, but... At the same time, the rigor and the learning is the same. You kind of just adopt. It's almost like another project or another course. You're just mm -hmm. kind of starting from scratch and learning the mechanisms of how things work. Like at, it, at, at school now, I'm just kind of like a freelancer where I'm just figuring out, you know, what my next project is going to be. And right now my focus is on products. 
how do I create revenue from a good product? How does Teams make so much money? Why are there, um, you know, half a billion users on there already? Like, how are they functioning? So this is like my next endeavor um, right now. So I do sit at this point. I graduated two years ago, so I'm, I've been out of school for a little bit now and definitely learning lots. Yeah, that's kind of my little pitch. Yeah. I think it's uh, like, I, I love I love the quote you just said. It's like, you know, I was trained in basically like paving roads and like talking to like foreman and operator. And now I'm just like kind of taking this space where I'm learning all these new things and like have all yeah. these kind of cool transitions. I think it's so exciting. Um, okay, one, one thing I'm actually curious on um, mm -hmm. and for reference for anyone listening, I'm a machine learning engineer, but I, I, I do want to know. Okay, so I've heard basically like program management and product management is kind of like running like a little bit of a startup within like a big organization. Like, do you mind talking a little bit about the role? I'm like actually really curious yeah. to learn from like my personal side too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> when I applied for Microsoft, um, I know I, I had a couple of friends that worked in the Azure department or others working in the Microsoft Office department. I, I heard all about work-life balance and how happy they were and how much... Um, I guess like how much free time they were having after work. Um, I knew jumping into a big corporation like Microsoft that that might have not been the exact lifestyle I wanted. I wanted to learn. Like if I was going to be uh, jumping into a big corp, it better be one that is startup y. Because my my goal at the end is always has always been entrepreneurship and to build my own startup. So. Mm -hmm. I heard that the teams department and us all knowing that, you know, in the last year, I think everyone knows someone who works on teams as a way of uh, meetings these days, as a way of work these days. So I knew coming in, it was going to be a startup vibe in a big corporation. So that was the goal. I don't think I would have taken um, any other opportunity at Microsoft except for this one. Um, but Truth be told, I am working the hardest I have ever worked. Um, I do think that I am experiencing the same, um, like, pace and, like, learning opportunities as though I was in a startup. We are, I think it was um, only seven people that started in the Microsoft Teams department, and now it's grown up to, like, I think 80 to 100 employees. So we wow. are our own separate entity um, people are starting from scratch. We have people coming from Amazon, people coming from Slack. Like it's literally its own little startup and you have to do everything from scratch, build all the processes from scratch, um, learn all about your competitors, um, all that stuff. So that's a little bit of an insider view on what is happening in the Microsoft Teams department. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like it's so fun because like, as you're mentioning, there's like so much going on um, kind of within that space and it is moving really quickly too. Like, I mean, yeah, I'm sure all of us like Tyler, I know you've been doing some remote work within this last year. I've been mm -hmm. remote for, yeah, like a year and a half straight. Like I've only in my current company, I've only been in the office like two times. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. One one thing I heard you say there that I'm like quite curious on is like your end goal is to like totally work on your own startups. Um, I'm wondering yes. like kind of what gave you the inspiration perhaps at like a younger age to get like involved in that area? Because I feel like kind of like tra tra the traditional career route, especially for us engineers, like, okay, like you, for example, civil or we can go chemical or we can go mechanical. It's like chemical. It's like, oh, you know, you're going to go join like a company and you're going to go work as a process engineer for five years and become a senior process engineer. And then you'll mm -hmm. start managing people and then you'll be a team manager after 10 years, et cetera. Whereas yeah. like, I feel like the startup uh, kind of mm, idea doesn't really get taught a lot to us in engineering school. So I'm, yeah, I'm really curious to kind mm -hmm. of learn about like where your passion came for startups. Yeah. Um, honestly, I feel like entrepreneurship and startup wasn't that big, you know, six, seven years ago when we started in university. Now I feel like it's almost like um, a way of, of, having your own career is to start your own business and to have autonomy over what you do. Um, what kind of inspired me back in school was honestly the very first instance that I had this inspiration was actually that good friend of mine that I worked on um, my language app with. He was kind of telling me 
um, you know, all these things he's doing, like a little project here, a little project there, like he's working on machine learning um, on one side, or he's working on uh, like a delivery uh, app on the other hand. And I was just like, how are you doing all these things and not feeling like pressure that maybe it won't go big or like maybe you don't have time for it or what if it just flops? And he told me that these are what he considered as projects. There's a beginning and the end of a project, mm -hmm. such as the beginning and end of a course. And that kind of inspired me to take a look at kind of like what I wanted to do and what are the things that I've always wanted to like um, get started or to just try and like dip my toe in. And I realized if I just tried one project at a time, go from beginning to end until I felt like it's ready to like, you know, let go of it or it blows up and it becomes like crazy. Like, you know, um, you know, our wish is always be the next like Facebook or the Airbnb or whatever. But every time you start a project, it's just like this spark of something new. Mm -hmm. And every time you go through with it till the very end, you know that you've learned way more than if you hadn't started. So that became became kind of like my North Star when starting things is that I do know I have an end. If I just start it, try it out, see if I like it. If I like every step of the way, I'll continue it. If it blow up, blows up, great. If it doesn't, yeah. then you finish it off and you push it aside and you start on something new. So I love that concept so much. I like <laughs> joined every single group I could. I um, even worked on like starting another student group back in school. And knowing that there was an end gave me that sense of like, just like curiosity. It gave me uh, like breathing room to just start something and try to go through to the point where you are, you've learned enough for yourself and then you kind of close it. So that helped me spark my entrepreneurship because then I started my e-commerce business and I started the app and, you know, like always ready to start something new if, if it comes to it and not afraid of failure, if that makes sense. That's awesome. That's a great, great mindset to have. And I have a lot of questions related to that because you're doing so much at such a high level right now. Um, but, uh, and I just, I want to reference your, the article that you wrote on mm -hmm. LinkedIn, because it was a fantastic piece. Thank I really you. resonated with everything in it. And so I'm going to try to not repeat the whole thing, but there's one spot <laughs> that specifically really resonated with me a lot. So I'm just going to read this small paragraph. Okay. Uh, and then I want your thoughts on some of that. So on top of the bad grades, no matter how hard I tried to listen in class, nothing clicked. My mind would just unfocus during lectures. I had zero motivation to complete any of my assignments on time. Yet when I volunteered to lead diversity and inclusion talks, host personal finance seminars and mentor junior students, my heart would soar and I would feel alive again. So that's kind of how you kick off your article, which I thought I was the only person that felt like that in university. So it was so great to read that someone else had that experience. Yeah. And then you go into say like one of the first points after that is what didn't make sense to you was to quit because you felt like that. What made sense to you was to build something on top of the degree and transform it into something out you something else, use it as a tool for something else. So now I know there's a lot of students in university now that I'm older, I know there's a lot that were in that exact same position that yourself and myself found mm -hmm. each other found in that position. What would you say to them as what are the first steps you can take to take that degree and start building it into something else? Yeah, I think I can literally trace back and this was um, written in my article as well. The moment that I kind of felt that realization and just reflecting over you know, what am I doing here? I think a lot of times back in school, we kind of sit there doing an assignment, you know, at 2 a.m. trying to like finish that energy drink and like get everything due by 6 a.m. Um, you sit there and you're kind of like, what am I doing here? I would challenge students these days to sit with that question for a little bit longer. Like I think a lot of people kind of just like, oh, what am I doing here? And then they're like, oh, whatever, I'm just going to follow this roadmap that has been laid up for me because it's there. I'm just going to do it. And then I'll figure out, you know, um, seven years later, you know, let's say like a couple of years after you graduated, I'll realize then, or I'll think about it then. I think that um, procrastination um, is it, that question will always come up like again and again, all, all these years, all the way until you're like 30 or 40, you'll always ask like, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? I would challenge some people to just sit with that question a little bit more and see 
exactly why did you uh, go into university? Why did you choose engineering or whatever it is that you're going in there, whatever it is that um, you're, the courses you're taking, like, like, like what is the purpose? For me, I found that when I was sitting in um, the co-op, uh, you know, like job searching session, and I was just like, you know what? I went through this degree because I, I wanted a job and I wanted to be, um, be able to contribute to society and like, like be employed and have a stable career or whatever. That is what this degree is for. But then outside of that, what do I want? Like after I'm financially secure, after I finish my degree, what else is there? And so I kind of realized that, you know, this degree will help me get to a certain point in life. But if I want more, I'm going to have to do the work that comes with it. And so I know uh, with you two, I've kind of done some stocking there that you guys have done a lot of extra curriculars that added up to on top of your degree. So you guys know this um, well in advance that you need to work for that extra like passion that you have, like whatever it is. Um, you know, I have friends that also did Alberta Sat, um, you know, satellites. Um, I know friends that have created um, businesses, either it's just like make or do lashes on the side. Yeah. You need to have that thing that motivates you to keep going. Because if not, that question will pop up when you're 36. And you're going to realize that all that time you could have at least had 10% of your mind space somewhere else. And that was kind of where I was sitting at. I was doing assignments on the side meetings on the other end, um, trying to learn more about apps and like how they work, um, learning more about businesses and how to make, uh, how to calculate revenue streams and like what channels, marketing channels could get people's attention. Those are the things that kept me going on the mundane tasks that I had. Um, I hope that. <laughs> that was excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Totally. I mean, um, Kind of just reflecting on all of that, I, I, I can completely agree with you on so many points because, um, like, you know, kind of even say, like, thinking about um, my university experience as well, too, right? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. we kind of have the tasks that we're supposed to do, but then we also have the things that are kind of more of the passion points, right? And I think, mm -hmm. like, I, I mean, Tyler and I have talked about this quite a bit, and I've talked about this with quite a few friends, too, is, like, you know, I think in everybody's life, like regardless of whether it's school or kind of personal life, like you do need to kind of find these things you're passionate about to like drive you forward, right? Because, you know, for example, like we might go through harder times in our work or we might go through harder times in our personal life. Whereas if we have mm -hmm. these things that like really give us passion or keep us grounded, like, you know, you're mentioning, for example, not just only doing your assignments, like going and doing meetings and like maybe like working on like a side project and kind of having like all these mm -hmm. little things, um, it can really kind of help us through these like difficult times in life. And uh, yeah, like kind of keep us rooted, rooted and grounded. And actually, like I want to steal a quote from actually one of the episodes we just posted. But basically, like the one thing that I love about it was um, we have Chris who said basically there's a lot of experience of your life that might not seem completely relevant to what you're doing right now. But actually, mm -hmm. I think they're all relevant, right? Like, you know, you're mentioning mm -hmm. you went and did business, uh, some business things like while well, you were in engineering school. So then I'm sure now that plays a role in like your current job, uh, you know, because you need to basically mm -hmm. like, like you're mentioning, like, you know, you're probably within this, uh, uh, you know, position and you need to like maximize your revenue on something. Um, but I want to bring this back actually to going through like difficult times. So mm -hmm. in university, I think I know, I know Tyler's situation. Uh, I also didn't have. I didn't have the best grades at a point in time too. Actually, funny story. Like I'm just going <laughs> to throw a quick story in here. My very first yes. year of engineering school, I I got a 2.7 GPA and I really wanted to get, my, my first choice was petroleum engineering co-op and my second choice was chemical engineering oh, co-op. I didn't yes. make petroleum engineering co-op, but I mean, it's probably yeah. like honestly one of the best things that happened because like it kept me like super neutral. Like chemical engineering is kind of like a pretty neutral thing. So, yeah. but yeah, I remember like, I was quite devastated at that point in time. Like, I was like, wow, like, you know, I couldn't even, you know, like, and all my friends are like, you know, mechanical engineers at that point, they're like, oh, I have like a 3.5 GPA, I have a 3.7 GPA. I was just mm -hmm. like, what am I doing? Ugh. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of curious, nice. like, yeah. you know, when students say are going through school and maybe things aren't going the way they planned and like, maybe they have like, you know, not the best GPA, like, do you have any advice to kind of like make students like feel like confident or like more um, determined on like the path that they're going down at that point in time? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I was going to write this in my article, funny enough, but I didn't have the room or the space for it. But 
I know that every single engineering student that has gotten into university or even um, I think for us, we had a transfer program as well. Anyone who's kind of gone through this, the motion of like being the smartest student back in high school or junior high or wherever it is, you're always like the you felt like you were like the smartest student. I think we all felt this, that when we came into post-secondary, you realize you're literally not the smartest person around anymore. And that takes a huge hit to your self-esteem. I know it has with mine. And I always kind of tell people like, you either take that and you personalize it and you're like, oh man, I'm a failure at life. Everything's, my whole future is like gone. It's not bright anymore. Or you finally have an opportunity to remove that sense of self, like AKA like like I am only smart because I had a 90 something percent in high school. Like every person that has gone through the struggle, I think it, it's almost like life giving you the opportunity to just like step away from that and be like, is this number really what is what going to impact me for the rest of my life? Like, or am I going to let this experience and this GPA be on my name tag forever mm -hmm. or not? And you get to choose that. I really believe that from so many mentors I've had throughout the five years of university, um, so many of them have told me GPA doesn't matter. But it was so hard to believe them because you're literally sitting there with your grades. Like, I remember my first chemistry exam or my first chemistry midterm. It was like 36 percent. And I was like, this is this is abnormal. I have never seen this number in my life. It doesn't exist in my vocabulary. And I was just like, wow, like, really? Like, is this what my future is going to be like? And, you know, I kind of just decided, like, no, you know, screw that. Like, screw all yeah. these things that I used to believe in because, like what happened to all the people that have had these grades and have been working for years now. So one thing that really helped me was I started to find mentors that could relate to this experience. I had many of them that have had low GPAs in first year and they're like, you know, what? I'm doing fine. Like, look at me and look at my life. And I was like, Oh my God, you guys aren't like dead. You guys aren't like academically handicapped. So um, seeing people, I guess like us, like you guys were saying that maybe you've experienced the same thing with your low GPA. Like, look at us. We're not like, we, we didn't turn out as bad as we, we thought when we were in first year. Like I would have never thought that like me at a 2.5 GPA in first year, uh, would be working at Microsoft right now. Like yeah. that unfathomable to me at 18, 19. So what I would suggest for, for um, students that are going through the same struggle is to just like look up and see um, if there are people that relate to you like us and really dig into like what they're doing now. Like, is it a failure or is it just a chance for you to just reflect over what you're, why you're doing this? Um, yeah. I think it all comes back. My GPA, honestly, um, what I would say that my GP has done for me is it has told me that Caitlin, you don't belong in civil engineering. Uh, every time I got a bad mark, it just solidified the fact that like, maybe this isn't what you're meant to do. And look at you doing all these other projects. Look at you inspiring all these other students. Look at you like being so happy in this other space when you're volunteering outside of school. This is where you belong, not here. So every time I got a bad mark or I didn't do as good as I thought and I studied for hours and hours, it just like every year validated that this isn't exactly your path and that's okay. You just need to refocus and try to find something that you do love. And I think that kind of like mindset has gotten me to this point so far. So now I see every failure as just like life telling me like, okay, just refocus on something else that maybe would give you more and not take away from you, if that makes sense. Would definitely agree. That makes a lot of sense. And your yeah. story there kind of reminded me of in my first semester when I did, I think it was the Antoine 30 exam and I got like 30% oh. on it. And I yeah. thought that that was the end of my, I didn't think I was going to make it out of first Lifetime. year. And so it's so yeah. life's on, life's over. Yeah. So I thought <laughs> like, it's so hard to see past first year when you're just like, how am I going to get through mm -hmm. this year? It's like, <clears throat> I'm not even thinking about second year, let alone what I want to do 
with a career, but it's important to think about it early on, like you said, and participate in different clubs all throughout university to position yourself uh, for when you're when you graduate and kind of find something that you care about. And um, I like how you kind of highlight how you can use your degree to put it towards something. I've always thought about it as like a force multiplier. So I'm just like, mm -hmm. once I figured out that I cared about the space industry, I was just like, I can have a greater impact there with an engineering degree than without one. So that became kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, a good reason to keep on going and kind of struggle through those exams and assignments, even if my GPA wasn't high, but to get the degree, because mm -hmm. that's kind of what mattered. Um, it builds but, character. That's what exactly. I said character. in my yeah. last year. This yeah. is building my character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You learn how to frame it correctly so you can live with it. You frame exactly. it in a positive way, right? <laughs> <laughs> work ethic <laughs> yeah exactly um i wanted to ask you something something that i like to ask people that have particularly full schedules or take on multiple projects so you know you work full-time yes. at microsoft you've always done a side project um mm -hmm. i got when i was in university i i had my project on the side as well and things get so crazy and so busy sometimes that i had to bring in some intense rules to just like have some balance in my life mm -hmm. i'm wondering you were saying earlier that you're learning so much right now that you didn't really want work-life balance. I'm wondering if you have some sort of work-work balance or, yeah. uh, you know, something that you do, because, you know, you do, you say that you have to think about things a lot and you should step back and think about stuff. Do you have some things you do on a daily, weekly basis to kind of keep that balance in your life despite all the things you do at such a high level? Yeah, um, actually, I learned these skills, um, not actually in school, I mean, in school as well, but in school, you're used to like burning out and then getting back up and being like, oh, that wasn't so bad as last burnout. <laughs> like I remember that was kind of how I was doing um, school and extracurriculars and like co-op terms. Like I was always burning out, um, but I'm a better me now. <laughs> Definitely I recognize the symptoms before it happens. Um, but so actually during IBM, I was uh, an IT consultant. So when I was doing that, I was working on projects um, all the time. It was like beginning to end of a project. And then there's like sometimes where I'm split between two projects. So 50, 50 and like my side project and all that stuff with that, what I learned, um, is that you need to be very, all goes back to kind of like what you're trying to do with your job and your work. Um, I always come into a job with like a set of skill sets that I want to achieve or learn. Um, and a set of skill sets that maybe I don't really care too much about. So like going into anything, knowing exactly what you're wanting to take out of it so that when you're in a corporation, especially with managers and teammates who always need something from you, you need to really be very clear as to like what you're trying to get out of this opportunity, whether it's going to be five years down the road, three years down the road, however long you stay at the company. So what I've learned is to be super efficient and focused on the things that I know is going to benefit me in my career. Everything else can wait. Like it literally can wait. Someone can be barging on my door, calling me on teams, sending me multiple emails. And I can be like, okay, I will get back to you at this time because I need to focus on these. And this might be hard for some because there are managers that have different priority lists and stuff like that for you. But my advice would be like, if some, if your manager were to come to you and be like, okay, I need you to do this. And you're like booked, like you're like, you know, you're not going to be able to add that to your list without dropping other things. I would actually redirect that question back to your manager and be like, okay, these are my priorities one to five. Um, in order for me to finish it in this order and to add your next task, can you tell me which I need to drop? So it's, it's a boundaries conversation and yep. you can look, um, people can look it up on articles and podcasts. There's so many about boundaries, but you need to know what you can do, what you're trying to get out of it and act accordingly. These days, my team works like nonstop, like early mornings to late nights, but I know myself and I do not want to spend my 8 PM need, uh, evenings in meetings nonstop. So what I've started to do was just turn off my laptop. Don't even an answer after 6 p.m. And if there is a conversation that has to be done, I will have to communicate that, that my boundaries are, I do work early, I do work efficiently. If you find that I'm missing any of the deliverables, you can let me know and I will work on it. But after 6 p.m., I cannot, or after the last meeting of the day, um, I cannot answer 
and all that stuff. So these are just conversations that you want to be having, especially in corporate with your managers, but also with yourself to figure out, you know, what does it take for you to be able to do your job and to be able to do a good job at that. Um, so those are the kind of things I'm learning, especially in this startup space where people are always working. It's just insane. And you will burn out every single day if you don't do something about it. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of one of the key things right now that I'm learning is to really stand up for myself, know what my boundaries are and communicate it like very effectively and very yeah. seriously because people will step right all over you if you do not say something. <laughs> Yeah, I think two words that come to mind there. Oh, I had I had one. Oh, okay, for sure, self-aware. And then the other one, uh, I just had one more word. What was I going to say? Uh, self-aware and also, um, I, I don't want. Okay, okay, I'm just I'm 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 just going to start with self-aware and then we'll let boundaries. my mind run for. Yeah, basically okay. boundaries. Yeah, like I was going to say, like kind okay. of yeah, like having like a good understanding of like what you are wanting to do and what you're not wanting to do, and like. Um, I, I mean, like one thing that I feel like this is, is like communication skills are really strong and also, um, yeah, like basically being able to set boundaries, like what's healthy and what's not healthy. Like I've, I've talked to this boat to Tyler, mm -hmm. but like my current role too, cause like I kind of run Singapore hours, but in North America. So it's like, you know, for example, I just got a meeting invite for an 8am Saturday morning from my boss, uh, just last night. And it was like, because yeah. Israel works Sundays and I'm running projects in Israel right now for like a company we just acquired and like. I just like, yeah. like, you know, like, you know, I have like maybe something on Saturday night that's going to run late. Like, I don't know if I want to be mm -hmm. up at 8, 8 a.m. in the morning. Right. And I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, my, my, my intuition is something like this. My intuition is young engineers and young professionals. We want to like basically give this impression of like, oh, you know, we're willing to do what's necessary in order to get the job done. But like, yes. you know, Caitlin, like it sounds like yes. you have such a healthy balance with this. And I completely agree with you. Like, you know, if, if you're getting up at 7 a.m. in the morning and like you're doing your work from 7 to 6, it's like, you know, something can wait. Like mm -hmm. most things on this earth are actually not so important that like it needs to be done like right, right now. And it I needs think the this, team's call. That's yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it, yeah, it's such a healthy balance, like the communication skills and kind of like setting boundaries. Um, I'm really wondering if you can kind of speak mm -hmm. to this and say like young professionals or students that are in school, because I know like, you know, Tyler, I, I don't know what your impression was like when you were a student in school or like young professional right now too. But I mean, like for sure when I was a student, you know, if a manager is like, mm -hmm. oh, can you do this? Can you do that? I'm like, well, I just want to make, you know, myself look good. Like I want to make myself look like a good employee. Mm -hmm. So like, I want to stay and do that right yeah whereas i think like once you have a little bit of experience behind mm -hmm. your back and like you have the confidence to that like you're saying caitlin like you can make your deliverables yeah. on time and like you're a good employee and like you do all the right things right like um do you mind mm -hmm. talking about like how you can build like better communication skills like assertiveness and maybe like understanding like your boundaries of like what's right and maybe like what's too much yeah yeah so i think this this comes from I think honestly, it comes from the, like your internal self-awareness. I think that we kind of highlighted that a lot is that once you get that confidence, like you maybe built, I think for me around one year in, and I think it's just, that's an abnormal timeline. Cause I think I'm just always feeling confident or whatever it is that it is about me. But after one year of me performing the best that I can, so doing those late nights and, mm -hmm. you know, I think there was one, one project where, you know, for five months I wasn't even like eating well, like I lost weight. My manager was commenting on how like I should be eating more. Like I'm like, like just burning out. I did my time. I was like that year yeah. in consulting, <laughs> you do your time there. Um, after that, Honestly, it's like, it's, ha it's your own confidence. I think that really emulates to people. Like I know people that are in their thirties and are still like, Ooh, I still need to impress my manager or like, Ooh, like, um, sorry. What I said sounded a little bit off. Like, like it's, it's internal first. So the very first thing I would do is build your confidence and be very, and this is, this helps with the whole, you know, if engineering wasn't for you and you work for five years to get a whole degree, like I felt at that point, I was like, okay, not everyone can do that. Like I hated myself for five years and I still did it. So I know that anything outside of this degree, I could do the same with. And I know like, you know, character building and discipline and all that stuff. So I know I'm a good employee. And so 
when you get that inner confidence, whenever it may be, it can be two years, three years, whatever it is that takes you to make you feel like, okay, like I don't have to prove to anybody that I can be, I can deliver and I can like do what I need to do. Um, you start just realizing from there that people, okay, let's, we can kind of like pull back to maybe coming out of school and getting your mm -hmm. first ever job offer. So I have um, looked through and done some research and apparently many employee, employers, when they give you your first job offer as like a fresh student, ha actually uh, expect you to negotiate your salary and negotiate terms. Yet, like, I, I bet, I don't have the statistics for this, but I bet like 100% of us do not want to negotiate. We're like, what? This is a job. Like I literally was meant like like did not make anything, and now I will make something, and I will take whatever I can get. But HR was trained to literally negotiate with you if you ever needed it. So I knew. So I found out that like at IBM when I started my job, they were literally expecting me to like negotiate for a higher salary. But I didn't. I'm gonna assume the same for many companies uh, outside of IBM as well. It. It comes with, like, after you get that confidence and after you get that years of experience or whatever it is, you start to realize you're worth more than you, you think you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, they're literally paying you to, like, work for eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, like, for a certain amount, and they have budget for it. You need to, like, kind of push that. So I'd say, so the advice, just to, like, summarize that part, is that, one, it, it comes from inside. It comes from the fact that, do you know yourself and do you know that you can do the work and you can know you, you can be successful? And then two, you'll start emulating it naturally. And third is start to know your worth in the market from there. Mm -hmm. And from there, the boundaries come easy because it's like, yo, like you need me. If I disappear tomorrow, like no one's going to do this work and you're going to have to spend three more months to hire someone else. So, so we should really start like having discussions on how I can work effectively and do the things you need me to do. And like, you know, not, I don't have to suffer a burnout or blah, 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 all this like other stuff. You learn that with time, but I think it starts from inside. Like you need to just know yourself and whether or not you are, you are a good employee and that your skill sets are contributing to the company and you are valued by your manager. That's super, super important before everything else comes with it. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. And I would say that the critical thing there uh, that I think of is just making sure that you have like self-respect for yourself, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, having boundaries or negotiating a salary, especially like, cause I know for me, when I got hired at my first job, I was just like, oh, perfect. You're going to hire me and I'm going to sneak in this low GPA. Like this is perfect. Like I'm not even going to push exactly. it. I'm not going to push my luck at all. So, exactly. um, mm -hmm. but you know, you have to take into account that the other things that you did and that you're not just the number that is your GPA and know that, you know, you got to know what you're worth and you got to, got to ask for that. And if they're already in a position where they're offering you a uh, salary, they're not going to like say, no, go take a hike. They're just the worst yeah. they can say is no, we're not going to give you that, yeah. uh, that number. And then you'll right? take it then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like exactly. Oh, okay, but that's... you should develop that practice of exactly. asking in any case, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Tyler, I exactly. just really want to jump in on a quick note. Like I recently had this discussion with another U of A uh, computer engineering alum, Arjun. Um, and he wrote an article basically talking about like why it's so critical actually early in your career to start building your salary negotiation skills. Because like, mm -hmm. say like all of us right now, we're kind of like, you know, probably getting closer to like intermediate sort of like positions in the companies that we're in. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas like when you're junior, basically your salary bands are quite small, right? Like you're maybe negotiating for a few thousand more a year, right? But like once you move to like a senior, that could be tens of thousands of dollars of difference. Yeah. And then at that point too, if like you don't start early, like it's, it's, it's a skill. Any skill requires development, right? So if you start mm -hmm. even the very first time around, and then you try to do it, then you're uh, like, you know, you're basically already like building that skill. And like Tyler just mentioned, no companies, like, uh, like I watched a couple of YouTube videos. They're like, they asked some people at like MIT has like, anybody pulled a job offer you from negotiating? Like this lady's like, I've done this thing for like 15 years. And I've only seen one hand go up. Like they pulled the offer for negotiation, right? Which is also mm -hmm. probably indicative. You don't want to work at that company. Um, so yeah, sorry, Tyler, please continue. But I just want to mention to anybody listening, like just, just try, like nobody come, no company's ever going to hold the offer on you if like they like you. Right. So yeah, but Tyler, mm -hmm. please continue. 
would would definitely agree. That's a, that's a really good point. And then I just wanted to kind of expand Caitlin's point to, um, you know, m earlier you mentioned that like if your boss comes to you with a lot of uh, another project to do and you kind of flip the question back to them, you know, what priority do you want me to drop? You can do that same thing. I feel like with your working hours because mm -hmm. you know if you're taking your your mind and your body is like a high value asset to you as well as the company and you have to mm -hmm. frame it like that to them you gotta i feel like flip that question back to your boss and your manager and be like if you have me on 8 p.m meetings and stuff like that then i'm gonna be less effective in the 9 a.m meeting because you know mm -hmm. i'm a human too and i need that and so the overall best ROI for the company is for me to stop working at this hour and have boundaries and take care of myself. So you always want to, I feel like frame it in a way with what's the benefit uh, for the company as well. And then you kind of have that self-respect for yourself at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I yeah. And you also really like, no, we, we really need to know what your, um, what you're trying to get out of this experience too. Right. Yeah. It's like, you realize maybe these 8 p.m. meetings isn't really contributing to what you're trying to learn and having those discussions with your manager openly. It's like, mm -hmm. I will be a lot more passionate if I'm working on one, two, three, four, right? And then from there, how can you help me? How can we build a better experience um, so that I can be a more effective worker and also get what I want out of this opportunity is all these things that I want to learn. So yeah. if you come in already with like, things you want to do, what are they going to say? No, we're not going to give you these learning opportunities. Yeah. Um, and just keep like pushing through with that because you end up kind of losing yourself in a big corporation and a big group. Because if you don't know what you want to do, people are just going to throw things at you until you burn out. Yeah. And realize exactly. None of these are what I want to do. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. I completely agree. Just one more thing I'll speak to you in terms of leverage for any student that's out there is, now that I've been at a few different organizations, I realize, and I think it's the same at Microsoft and probably where Dave is working too, the amount of time that they invest in you to get you ramped up. So mm -hmm. when you're like six months That's in right. or a year in, the amount of training and learning you've done, it's not it's not going to be easy for them to be like, oh, well, your personal boundaries, I'm going to fire you. Like, that's not going to happen. They spend so much time molding mm -hmm. you into a good employee um, for that role. Um, and I think that I kind of want to pivot a little bit there because you molded yourself into a good employee for that role long before that. So, you know, you come from that civil engineering background, so a non-tech background and you got into tech and it doesn't have to just be civil. It can be mechanical. It can be, I feel like there's a lot of backgrounds of engineering um, that are non-technical and a lot of students realize that be halfway through the degree or when they graduate that they want to get into tech. So you seem to have taught yourself a lot about that. What are some really like tangible strategies that you use to, uh, develop technical skills to the point where you can work at a technical company from not uh, having that background? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to speak to those that might not be a, like too technical, like software engineer. Mm -hmm. um, like, I you know, like Dave kind of just codes and stuff like that, all those things. But um, for those that, you know, don't necessarily, I feel like people, when they think of tech, they're like, I need to go to a coding boot camp. Like I need to learn Python or like all that stuff. I, I feel like honestly, like the, the very key, um, especially during my interviews and like the key skill sets that I brought to the table from a more consulting background into like a, a technical program, product management role, um, were a, can you communicate with developers? <laughs> can you take whatever these developers are saying, whatever it is, and interpret it and be able to communicate it to those that are non-technical? -te so one is communication skills, learning all the ins and outs of like, like what software engineers are saying. Like what is, even like I, I remembered Microsoft uses shipping, like shipped a product. I had no, mm -hmm. like, that was the first question um, in the application. It was like, have you shipped a, pro a software? And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> I had to ask all my, like, my software engineer friends, like, what is shipping? Like, what, what does that mean? Because, like, for IBM, it was, like, go live or, like, whatever. It was, like, different terminology. So the second would be to either have a chat with software engineers or, like, people that are already in tech and, like, ask them all these questions about acronyms and phrases and terminology and, like, just go into that space. Just, like, surround yourself with people that are already in the tech industry. They'll, like, give you nuggets of, like, wisdom on, like, what do you actually do? Like, I sat my friend who used to work at Microsoft and I was, like, what do you do? Like, what is your job? And, like, um, so 
I kind of took that and I was like, oh, I can do that. Okay. I can just like make sure I phrase it in a way that makes the same. It's like literally project management, but you're doing it in the tech industry. Um, so those that are traditionally, I think a lot of us coming out of engineering that are non-technical, I think we all work as like project coordinators or like project management or like managing whatever it is, the costs and stuff of, of things. Just from there, try to convert those skills into just like like tech. Like what is the beginning and end of a project in tech? What are fe new features that are being added to, to tech products? Um, I was lucky to be exposed to it a little bit earlier on in school because of the app that I was building. Um, so I encouraged um, some of my juniors back at IBM who was kind of asking the same questions. I was like, start a project, start something that you're like super passionate about, whatever it may be. Um, one of them ended up starting a, um, similar to skip the dishes, but for cold food. So she started like delivering um, cold food um, you know, in the box and stuff like that, built a business model, reached out to clients and stuff. And now she's kind of developed those skill sets and I'm trying to link her up at Microsoft too and stuff like that. So I would say explore. You're never too old. Like she was like um, out of school. She was like, that was her first job at IBM. And she started a project then. And she's immersed in that and being able to build a website, launch a website, um, figure out marketing, do all those things. So I would say immerse yourself in the space and two is to start a project, start anything. It could be like whatever it is that you have full control over and it's something that you would enjoy every minute doing it outside of work. I would really, yeah, those are the kind of the two things I would um, suggest. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I can completely relate to that. It's like, you 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 sort of figure out your passions through like all these little like little side endeavors and actually i mean kind of just sharing with you too i feel like now that we're we've interviewed quite a few people i'm noticing so many like positive personality traits from like a lot of the people that like come on the show like caitlin like it's obviously like, you're a very curious person right like you like to go and like try and kind of like see different things and whatnot and i i, I see this with like a lot of our other guests too um, and I think, yeah, from like the side project experience is like, you know, you're, you're saying like, oh, have you ever like shipped a product or something like that? Right. It's like mm -hmm. the terminology is always like a little bit different, I think between each company, but like the more that we can kind of spend just doing different tasks, um, like it does help us grow. Um, I, I have, I have one question in particular, maybe this is going to kind of like talk to people who want to get into larger tech organizations. Um, you know, I know from my experience, like basically like interviewing for technical roles is like quite a rigorous process especially if you're joining like tech organizations or larger mm -hmm. organizations do you mind talking a little bit on your interview experience and maybe any prep for like people getting ready for interviews and going to larger tech organizations yep um i can speak to the pm so the product management roles mm -hmm. um there's a couple of books that you can read thoroughly i like went through like scoured both these books it's the uh, crack the code yeah uh, crack the yeah, yeah crack the PM interview. Yeah. Um, and then decode, I think. Oh, that, I mixed them up. Okay, decode and then crack the PM interview. Um, those two are like really, really good. I don't think they're, I didn't even read anything outside of those two books um, to prepare for product management interviews. Uh, and funny enough, I did um, apply for, so entrepreneur first. Um, they also mm -hmm. had a lot of product questions in there as well. So entrepreneurship programs as well as big tech companies. I think the more you know about product management, you realize it's not like a huge, like it's not that much more dif different and difficult than normal project management experiences. You're just, instead of working on a project and cost financials and calculations and timelines, you're working on a product and like within that product, you know, like, who are the users? How many are using them? Are they having a good experience with this? What are the new features that we can add to make it better? It's like, instead of just looking at a higher level product is just like almost like shrinking it. So going from consulting to PM for me was actually not even that. It was like entirely like a lot easier <laughs> to be honest. And so for, for my consulting friends, um, if there are any listening, um, that is actually like not as bad. Just read the material, learn everything you can about product management, have an experience doing a side project um, or anything in the tech space. 
and you're like golden. You just need to mm -hmm. just practice. Um, the second advice I would get is to network a lot. I think we didn't really touch on that, but I'm a huge advocate for networking. Why totally, I think yeah. we're all here right now <laughs> is through our extensive networks. Um, but uh, I actually talked to four different Microsoft people from different organizations and different levels and stuff like that before I even applied because I really needed to know what the infrastructure looked like in that in the organization. And that's how I found that the team's team was like the startup of the corporation. I don't think I would have been happy if I was in like Azure or something. I, don't, I just have no idea what is going on in that world uh, in cloud and stuff like that. But um, like do your research on the company, um, find a couple of people that work there and ask for their opinion, what they're doing, if they like their job. And then uh, do your research on the role that you're applying for. And so I know Microsoft is just literally software or program manager. So there's only like two um, that you would go down the streams of anyway. So those are the kind of the two things for those that are job searching and wanting to get into um, big tech. That's really good advice. Really good advice. And now, Caitlin, I know we could talk to you for hours because it's been very interesting, <laughs> but we do have to wrap up at some point. Yes. Um, but I'll just give you a chance. Any other little bits of advice or words of wisdom that you would give to current students right now just to end things off? Any last little notes? Um, yeah, I think um, the only thing I would really try to iterate if, if they took anything from this conversation, <laughs> um, it would be to really like know yourself. And to sit with that question of like, what am I doing here? And why am I doing this? Like, it's uncomfortable. It's a very uncomfortable question, especially when you're young and you're um, just still trying to figure it out. Any like answer you get from that question that you ask yourself, like, why am I doing this? What makes me feel good in this degree? What makes me feel like happy? What makes me like, what lures me in to what I'm doing? like hold on to that, whatever answer you get. Like for me, it was like, oh, I like um, talking to people and understanding what they need. That's why I chose civil engineering. Cause I was like, I want to build houses for people. I want to build infrastructure for people because like, I want to know, I want to know that I'm impacting someone's life. And that answer carried me to now because now it's the same answer. It's I'm just doing it in a different way. How do I help people that have a better uh, video conferencing experience or be able to work in a hybrid workspace? So okay. just simmer with that question a little bit, um, journal about it, talk to people about it, just find yourself. And the earlier you do that, everything will just follow the way it has for me at least. Yeah. And yeah, that's my part really? words. It's so positive. I know Tyler and I are big <laughs> journal guys too. We love self-reflecting. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like we're all introspective guys. <laughs> all, all introspective, like big, yes. big, big time journal fans. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this was awesome. Um, just want to thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, we, as always, with like every guest we have on the show, we're like, literally, we could probably talk for like three hours and like go down like big rabbit holes, but we'll keep yes. this nice and concise for today. But thank you so much, Caitlin. It's been amazing talking with you. Awesome. Thanks yeah, thank you. Guys. Oh, our pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. That was that was fantastic. You dropped a lot of wisdom today. Anybody that listens to this is going to get a lot out of it. And if you want to hear some more from Caitlin, be sure to go look and read her article that she posted on LinkedIn. We'll drop the yes. link in our in our show notes. It's very good. Awesome. Uh, I encourage every student to read it. So thank you very yeah. much, Caitlin. Awesome. Yeah. I'm working on another one. So that will come out soon. So in today's episode, uh, we had Caitlin. Such an awesome episode. Really enjoyed all the content. Um, just kind of referring to some of the things that she was mentioning, like I actually really enjoyed uh, basically some of the portions that she was talking about getting prepared for say like technical interviews, like uh, say like going into uh, program management or being like a product manager. Cause I know there's probably a lot of people listening to the podcast that are interested, like they have really relevant skill sets, but maybe not so sure like what you can do to prepare. So I know she referenced a couple of good resources in there, including um, yeah, like cracking the product manager book. And I know there's one for coding that I've used before cracking the coding interview. So if you're interested in that, you can look at that. Um, so much awesome wisdom too about like kind of like setting healthy boundaries that's like even something i know i like you know i'm working towards and getting better at and like having kind of um the courage to have more like difficult conversations with your manager like say like she was mentioning that you know i have these five priorities like i'm already full 
you know, do like, so if you really want me to do this, like, which one do I need to take off? Right. Rather than just kind of be like, oh, I can handle this. Like I can do a lot of these things, which I think like sometimes for us as younger engineers and younger professionals, we can sometimes have that attitude. It's like, oh, I'll just add it to my list. It's not a big deal. But really like we need to be careful about how we balance our schedules because yeah, like I know we talked in the interview about as well too, like we are our own assets, like our health and our well-being are our own assets. So then if you want me to take a meeting at 9 p.m., then like Tyler's saying, you know, my 9 a.m. meeting the next morning, I'm probably not going to be as productive or as good at because like, you know, I'm run down. Um, yeah, Tyler, like what's your thoughts on the episode? Like, I, I know you really enjoyed it too. Oh, I thought it was great. Yeah, she like, she hit on so many important things that I think it's easy <clears> to <throat> forget once you get into the working world and kind of just make your life about your work uh, and everything like that in terms of setting healthy boundaries and everything like that. I also really liked the way that she chose to view projects and side endeavors that she took on. She, the point that she was making about, you know, the way you can do so many projects is that it has a defined start and a defined end. So it's like not forever. It doesn't, it's not all consuming for your entire life. And then another important thing she mentioned was you have to know what you want to get out of it. Right. So you go going kind of with a goal about the skills you want to develop. And he, she's like, and then you focus on that. There might be other skills that you don't have to really care about. You don't have to pay attention to, but you got to know what's going to be, uh, good for your own self development. So I thought that that was really important. And I think she gets a lot of that from like, she says, reflecting. So like taking a step yep. back and thinking about your why, thinking about why you want to do things and kind of sit with that question a little bit longer, it might be uncomfortable. And it was, it, it's funny, it made me think of I had listened to another uh, podcast online. And this guy had recommended this exercise, because he says, like, oh, our minds are kind of like, you know, we've got our, our brains are almost like an inbox with like, 200,000 unread emails because we have so much, so many distractions. We're doing things all the time. Our phone's always in front of us. Um, so what he recommended is for 60 days, you get up in the morning and you just sit for an hour. And what's going to happen is your brain is going to go through the inbox and churn them out and you're going to address every single email and you're just going to feel better kind of at the end of the day after mm -hmm. those 60 days and you'll be less distracted and stuff like that. And I think it speaks to a little bit as well of that idea of just sitting with your own thoughts for a while examining really why am i doing something and that'll help you make better career decisions like caitlin was saying so i mean i i really like that piece of advice to kind of step back and just think about it a little bit um and yeah and also i i like the tidbit uh that she was mentioning about how on her interview she like i uh, didn't know what shipping uh <laughs> was in the tech industry she's like i've never shipped the software before not one software and so i, mean, I thought that you was didn't, great you I, didn't and, you didn't you didn't put a piece of software in the mail and like ship it like no, Tyler, <laughs> yeah, like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah exactly so i but so i wanted to tie that back to and and so she's doing it now she's working at microsoft so she's at that level and then she can still do that so that doesn't so like anyone can really take the steps to kind of get there and i want to make the connection back to um, Chris McNichol, our first uh, mm -hmm. interview when he was doing product development for uh, a software company. And he had to sit down with the developers and go, what the hell is an API? I yeah. have no idea what the API is. And he's the project manager, right? So, but then he, at the end, he said that he earned the respect too, because he mm -hmm. had the, you know, the humility to kind of admit that he didn't know uh, what that was and just learn. I think it's about that learning growth mindset. We saw that from Caitlin as well. So, and we've seen that from a number of other guests too. And so you can see all these outliers that are just, you know, rolling with the punches and focused on learning and, you know, doesn't really matter if you fail something, you just kind of keep going and keep on trying again and get better and better and get something out of every single experience. And I feel like that's the mindset she had. So I could have listened to her for hours. That's for sure. And so I feel like a part two will come at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. And any other thoughts from you on the interview, Dave? I, Tyler, I think you kind of like you, you hit everything. Um, yeah, I, I once again really enjoyed it. We're looking forward to hopefully having her on at another point too down the line. Um, just kind of pick you know more wisdom from her. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed the episode today. Uh, as always, like Tyler, you know, mentioned in the intro, I'll say like you know smash that like button. We got to defeat the <laughs> we we got to defeat the algorithms on YouTube. So if you if you hit that like button, then we'll get more people looking at our content. Also, you know, uh, if you also hit the subscribe button, you're also helping defeat the algorithms. Like, you know, just help us defeat the algorithms. Like that, that that's all we're asking for in return, right? Like, yeah. and, you know, that, that helps us get better guests on because if we defeat the algorithms then more people will watch this, meaning more people want to come on the show. So like, you know, we just, need... just do, just do your part, please, please. Like we're, we're we like, we're so like, we're like, yeah, like, thank you Whoever so much. Whoever DMs me saying that they like the show, I'll name my firstborn child after you. <laughs> okay. That's, yeah, please like, get on there and like, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit yeah a little excessive <laughs> i mean i'm not I'm, I'm not going there i'm just asking to help yeah. you to feed no problems from dave on that one yeah <laughs>
Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. <laughs> but no, but seriously, guys, it's, it'd be much appreciated. Like and subscribe, and then you know we'll get more good content for you guys in the future because me and Dave like doing this. Um, so, yep. uh, yeah, join the community for sure of uh, Trailblazers. And if you know anybody that you want to see on the show, for sure, send us their names. Reach out to us. LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, all the stuff that we're on. You can see us on Spotify too, YouTube, mm -hmm. everything. So just don't be afraid to reach out, guys. Hope you have a good day and uh, enjoy the interview. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks. See you.